This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. Guess what, y'all? We are... We have been on an 18-part journey, and I know I've, I've thrown different numbers, and somebody corrected me this last week and said, Pastor, we did a few messages, and it's an introduction to the series that was also part of the series. We have been, for the last, uh, actually been started 20 weeks ago, but there was Easter, and then there was another week that kind of came in between. So um, for the last 18 weeks, or uh, 18 messages, we've been talking from the sermon series Upside Down. Uh, and we've been in a study of this, the first book that Paul writes to the church in the city called Thessalonica. Paul is writing to them and encouraging them and strengthening them. Here is an infant church, a church in its infancy, a church in, uh, you know, that's, that, that's going through so much. As much as they are strong in their faith and as much as they love Jesus and as much as they have, you know, pursue God with everything that they have, they also have challenges in their lives. They have issues within the church. They have issues in their own Christian walks. And in many aspects, we can identify with the church in Thessalonica. Not only because they had issues, but also God called the church in Thessalonica to be a cultural uh, manifestation of God's grace. Uh, he chose the church in Thessalonica, led by the Apostle Paul and his co-laborers Silas and Timothy, to come alongside and say, hey, we want to make sure that we make a difference in this city. They resolved to turn their worlds upside down. They walked into their, their city. They walked into their churches. They walked into their workplaces. And they wanted to be the hands and feet of Jesus to turn their world upside down. And we have been through five chapters of studying over the course of 18 weeks. It's been amazing. The journey has been amazing. And today is that last part of our study in 1 Thessalonians. Man, it's been amazing to study this book. But the closing verses of chapter number five, to which we now come, there are these wonderful practical guidelines that Paul writes before us, presents to us, as to how we ought to live Christianly or in our Christianity in three different areas of our life. Primarily, he talks about how we have to act towards leaders of our church. He then talks about how we have to live with other believers within our community, how we have to honor them, how we have to respect them. And the third is how we have to live towards God and respond to the situations that he often puts us in. So it brings us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 to 28 is where we're going to go with the scripture reading for today. So if you're there with me, turn to verse number 19 of chapter number 5. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, you can follow along. But hey, I want to give a shout out. How many of you have your actual Bibles with you? Can I see your Bibles? All right, lift it up in the air like you don't care. All right, wave it around. All right, it's amazing to have your physical Bibles with you, okay? And if you're taking notes, man, I love you too. All right, so take your Bibles. Let's read this fast. Okay, if you don't have your Bibles, totally fine. You could be reading your Bibles on your iPhone device. How many of y'all have your iPhone Bibles? Let me see your iPhone Bibles. There you go, all of y'all proud people. Android, one person. Okay, good. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but, but man, no matter how you're reading the Word today, I pray that we will be able to read together and understand this passage that God has uh, in store for us today. Okay, so I'm starting with verse number 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Verse 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Some of y'all are like, man, we're done with 1 Thessalonians. It's going to be amazing as we conclude this passage. 
There's so much power packed in these verses. Uh, first, as I was preparing, I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to put this whole message into 40 to 45 minutes. So y'all pray for me. Uh, I hope that I can finish in 45 minutes. If not, it's just going to take an hour. No big deal. No, just kidding. We're going to try to stay under 45 minutes, okay? But here it is. We've been talking about the 16 commands, the 16 final instructions that Paul is trying to give to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, he, it's, like, it's like he's encouraged them, he's blessed them over the last five chapters, and this is the grand crescendo of sorts where he's saying, guys, you cannot even imagine what I have, what I have in store. Here, here are some instructions and some commands for the church in Thessalonica. Number one was respect and esteem uh, in love, those who labor among you, the leaders of your church. He then said, the second point was be at peace among yourself. And then he said, admonish the idle. He said, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and, and be patient with them all. Do not repay evil for evil, but seek to do good for one another. Seven was rejoice always. Eight was pray without ceasing. And nine, we said, give thanks in all circumstances. That's where we ended last week. In verse number 19... Paul starts with the 10th command, and he says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. You know, this command could be paraphrased like this. A lot of y'all are sitting there and like, Pastor Asher, I have no idea what Paul is talking about. How do you quench God? As we know, the Holy Spirit, we believe the Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity. He's, he's, the, he's, he's one in the Godhead. And, and, and so many people are confused. How can we quench God in his, in his you know, mightiness, in his, in his power, in his might? How can we even grasp our mind around the idea that you and I can quench God? But if I have to paraphrase it, it sounds something like this. Stop putting out the fire of the Holy Spirit is what Paul is saying. Stop hindering and repressing the Holy Spirit is what Paul is trying to say. For in doing so, you're preventing him from exerting his full influence. You and I as Christians and believers need to understand something that we are different from the rest. We are different from everybody out there. Why? Because we have a power that God has given us. At the moment Jesus comes into your life and my life, the Holy Spirit also takes residence in your life. And when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, the Bible reminds us that he gives you power. The power to trample on snakes and scorpions, power over every power of the enemy. He gives us power. That is what makes you and me different. Some of us grew up in a church and probably grew up in a church that never actually talked about the Holy Spirit. Some of us probably grew up in a church that actually talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Some of us probably grew up in church and was like, what is the Holy Spirit? I have no idea what you're talking about. Some of us are freaked out by this idea of spirit because that just sends waves down your spine because something does not sound right with spirit and God. For some of y'all, you probably heard about the Holy Spirit, but when you did hear about the Holy Spirit, you referred to him as an it and not as him. And others were probably taught about the Holy Spirit and said, don't give too much of importance to the Holy Spirit because it's not that important. And some of us get freaked out and scared because we don't fully understand what the Holy Spirit really does in our lives. So today, allow me this morning to kind of break this down for you. As a church, we always talk about how, who, and who we are as a church. We are a Bible-believing church, which means there is nothing that will be preached from this pulpit, from this stage, that will be outside of the Word of God. If there is something that is spoken from this pulpit, I charge each one of you to hold me accountable as your pastor, to say, Pastor, I don't know about what you said. I don't know if there's some biblical backing to that. No matter what I prepare on a Sunday morning and I feed you with, I make sure I do my due diligence to sit in the presence of God and study the scriptures and make sure that every word that comes out of my mouth, I'm human, I make mistakes, but I try my level best to make sure sure that every word that comes out of my mouth is rooted in the word of God. So as much as we're Bible-based, we're also a spirit-filled and a spirit-led church. 
which means we don't shy away from what the Holy Spirit does. An example of that was what happened last week over here where we didn't have control of the service and the Holy Spirit took over and, and God started doing some amazing things and that is what the Holy Spirit does. But there are so many people and so many Christians that will get by by saying, we don't need the Holy Spirit. And, and, and Francis Chan calls the Holy Spirit to many people as the forgotten God where we just push him aside to a corner and we don't mind, we don't bother, we don't give emphasis on the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible depicts the Holy Spirit in different ways as water, as fire, and uh, one of the ways I said is like fire, and, and the question that you and I have to ask him, ask ourselves is, how do, can, can the Christian, how can the believer quench the Spirit? Or in other words, how do we extinguish the Holy Spirit? You know, this means that we need to recognize the Spirit is working in our lives and we should not reject Him. We should start at that point. There are so many Christians that need to understand that they need to stop rejecting the Holy Spirit. Not just rejecting, but ignoring the Holy Spirit. We have to be learned about, we have to be studied about what the role of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Because as I talk about this, I remember the Levitical orders that, that, that God gave the, the Levites, the priests, back in the Old Testament when he said, man, it is your job, it is your responsibility that the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on and on and on and on. At no time should the fire go out. And it is your job, the priest's job, to make sure at all times of the night and all times of the day, the fire in the temple and the flame in the lamp was always lit inside the temple and guess what you and I are priests God has anointed you and me as priests today Hebrews tells us about that and because we are priests God is looking at you and me and saying we are tasked with the responsibility of making sure that the fire of the Holy Spirit is never quenched is never put out in our lives and we would not we should not reject it we should not ignore the Holy Spirit because when we reject or ignore the Holy Spirit we tend to quench the Holy Spirit And the church in Thessalonica, Paul is giving them a warning. And he's saying, man, you need to stop because Paul senses this. The reason he even brings it up is because he senses that somebody in the church or a group of people in the church are probably weirded out by the Holy Spirit, are weirded out by whatever the Holy Spirit is doing. They don't have control over it. They don't have, I, I, you know, and, and in a second, we're going to understand what about the Holy Spirit they're weirded out by. And Paul is like, guys, I want to warn you, do not quench the Holy Spirit just because you don't understand something. Just don't make, you know, accusations and don't just go around telling people the Holy Spirit is this and the Holy Spirit is that because there are consequences that come by blaspheming God and blaspheming the Holy Spirit and he's giving them a warning over here and he's saying man I'm, I'm noticing something going on within the church and I want to be very careful to make sure and, and, and when Paul is looking at them and saying I'm, I want to make sure that we address this do not quench the Holy Spirit now here's the thing in order to understand this we have to draw a parallel to Ephesians, right? So to understand the implications of quenching the Holy Spirit, we have to understand what it means to even grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, how can somebody quench God? How can somebody quench the Holy Spirit? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 to 32, this is what the Bible says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Wow, that's hard hitting. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. He's saying, do you, do you want to know how you could grieve the Holy Spirit? Here you go. And he lists out all these things, and I don't want to go over them, but you just read the long list of things. He said, if you hold on to all these things, you know what? Let me go ahead and read it again. It says, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. When I do all of these things, when I engage myself in these things, when I engage myself in malice, in jealousy, when I'm unkind to somebody, that could be my wife, my husband, my children, my parents, my friends, 
The relationships I'm in, when I'm unkind, that's what the Bible says, be kind to one. When, when I'm not tenderhearted, when I'm not forgiving to one another, when I'm holding on to stuff, the Bible says what? You what? What do you do to the Holy Spirit? You grieve the Holy Spirit. Those are the reasons that he gives. Now, there's a difference between quenching the Holy Spirit and, the, and, and grieving the Holy Spirit. You want to hear the difference? Here it is. Quenching is what you do to the Holy Spirit of God, while grieving is his response to your actions. I'm going to say that one more time. Quenching the Holy Spirit is what you do to the Holy Spirit of God. The actions that you take against the Holy Spirit of God, while grieving is his response to your action of quenching. Because we have to break this down. To quench anything, if you were to talk about water or, or liquid, when you're, when you're thirsty, you quench your thirst by downing some water. Or, you, or in this respect, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's like a candle, a, a wick that's burning and there's a flame on it, and all you go do and you just hold it, and I don't know how many of y'all are crazy as I am. Some of y'all blow it like normal people do. But, you know, some people go and like, like hold on to the wick and you extinguish the fire. And the moment you extinguish that fire, you have quenched the light that was present in the room. And the Bible is referring to that when we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is hindered. Think about the light that that, that candle was emanating, the, the light that that candle was given out, the room that was lit up by that light. The moment you go and reach out your hand and you silence that light, when you quench that light, what it was doing to change and transform the atmosphere now has completely changed and darkness has come because of your actions. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to us about today. When we slander, when we, uh, when we have unforgiveness in our hearts, when we talk unkind to one another, when we don't respect one another, when we don't uphold one another in love, in kindness, in generosity, what are we doing to the Holy Spirit? We're looking at the Holy Spirit and saying, Psst. because guess what? It's the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to do these things. In a few weeks from now, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit. It might be a two-week uh, mini, not series, but in between series, like we just, uh, we we're concluding First Thessalonians and we're about to go and study the book of uh, Habakkuk. And before we study the book of Habakkuk, we're going to do some one-off messages and standalone messages and messages that God has been putting on my heart throughout these last few months that I'm wanting to share with the church for this season of our ministry as a church and in your lives and speaking into your lives. And, and part of that is, I, I, I try to do this on a yearly basis, is remind us or remind each one of us of what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. So when, when, a, when, when a person is born again, when, when he is regenerated, when somebody gives their heart to Jesus, remember this, Jesus does not just come to your heart, but the Holy Spirit comes into your heart too. And when the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, he gives you the ability to produce fruit. He just doesn't come there and just live there. He gives you the ability as a Christian to make a difference, to make change happen. And what that's called is the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, kindness, and we can go over that, but there's, there's no time for us to go. But the Holy Spirit produces these gifts. But the Bible says, man, when you do these things that we talked about, malice and slander and, and unforgiveness and unkindness and all these things, what we're doing is we're looking at the Holy Spirit and saying, man, all the gift-producing ability that you're giving me, I don't want to do anything. I don't want anything to do with that. And you're ignoring that and you're pushing that away. And God's like, man, the more you quench, the more the Holy Spirit is. It's grieving. Now, how can the Holy, how can God grieve, Pastor Ashish? Because God is this, this person, the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a thing. It's not an it. It's a person who has emotions and feelings. And then and, and, and because you hurt the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, man, I'm in here to give you life. I'm in here to give you uh, power. And you keep pushing me away. And the more you keep pushing me away, I grieve. Am I talking to somebody today? And Paul is encouraging the church and saying, man, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Stop quenching the Holy Spirit is what he's trying to say. Man, let, let's go through this for a second. Can we, can we take some time to go through this for a second? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you a few examples. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do on a regular basis in our lives? And there's so many things, but I'm going to give you four things. Is that cool? 
What does the Holy Spirit do and how can we stifle? How can we quench his work in our lives? Go to John chapter 7, verse 38 and verse 39. John 7, verse 38 and 39. Jesus is making this proclamation and he's saying, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And now this he said about what? The Holy Spirit. Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit and saying, man, when you accept me as your Savior, when you accept me as your Lord, when I come into your life, it's going to be joy like living waters. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said, that is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Or in other words, when I come into your life, you have so much to offer to the people around you. You're going to be a fountain of water. You're going to be a fountain of life. Water is life, Anjali. Water is life. And the moment you drink water, you are filled with what? Life. But think about it that way. The Bible says when I come inside your life, not only do you get life, but you become somebody that gives life to people around you. Am I being that Christian that offers life? Do I offer hope? Do I offer comfort? Do I offer strength? Do people come to me and use me as a watering hole? Do people trust me to say, pray for me, intercede for me, stand with me? Or do they even know that you're a Christian at your workplace? Oh yeah, brother, I wear, I, I, you, you don't see the cross around my neck? No, that doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. I, I love the fact that you have the cross around your neck, but your witness is more important than the ornament that you wear. The pendant does not witness for you. It's your lips. It's your life. It is your testimony that stands and says, there is a living God. He saved me. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. It is your testimony that stands up and tells people about who you are. It's the life inside of you. So point number one, what that verse tells me is this. What does the Holy Spirit do in my life? The Holy Spirit fills me with the water of life. It gives me life. The Holy Spirit fills me with life. So so if that's what the Holy Spirit does, how can you quench him? How can you stifle him? Is when you allow yourself to run dry. If you ever position yourself in a place where you're not receiving. You know, I grew up in India and um, my my parents are from the southern part of India in in a state called Kerala in India. And... uh, and we would do our summer vacations there. I grew up in, in another state, not in Kerala, but we would go every summer to go visit our grandparents in the state called Kerala. And one, one, one thing that Kerala was, is known for are its coconut trees. And uh, I love the coconut trees there. And, and I would see how these people would, uh, they would come and they would pluck these coconuts from the trees. And they would also have this other tree that they, that they had that was very remarkable. And my grandparents had this in their backyards, and they would harvest stuff from this. And, and I, was, I always wondered what this did. And, and, and all, all we saw was they would take these coconut shells, and even though it was not a coconut tree, it was a rubber tree. It was a tree that produced rubber. And the sap of the tree, when it came down, they would, they would make these grooves in the tree, in the bark of the tree. And it would come down, and the groove will fall down into a coconut shell that they would use uh, that, that would catch the rubber sap that fell into that coconut. And, and once a day... There would be this man that came along, all right, and he would, what he would do is he would go into those shells, he would take those shells, and he would empty that rubber into his bigger container. He would go around hundreds of trees around the yard and make sure that every tree has been accounted for, and he would empty each one of those coconut shells to make sure he secures that rubber. And then he would take all of that rubber, he would go to the mill, he would pass that rubber through a certain machine, which will then produce rubber sheets, which he will then sell in the market for money. All right, amazing. But here's the thing, what I'm trying to say, rubber has nothing to do with it, but here's the thing. There are some times that we would notice that he would take these coconut shells and he would sometimes put it back in its place. But there was this one time that I went back and I, 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 I I I was on vacation this one time and I had to go back. This guy was so quick that, that as he was taking it, he was like going from tree to tree to tree to tree. And sometimes he would put it back in its, in its place. And, and other times he would just like put it in, an, in a haphazard way. And there's these coconut shells that were like, you know, tilted 90 degrees or 75 degrees. And what, what would happen then is the, the rubber sap the next day, 
it, it would fall down and it wouldn't have a place to fall and it would, it would tilt over, it would fall over and he would lose all the love, rubber and he would come back the next day and be like, what happened? Oh, I didn't put it back right. See, it was, it's so important to position yourself in order for you to receive what God always has an offer for you. See, God's output of mercy and love and what the Holy Spirit does never stops. That will all, just like this tree that produces this rubber sap, it will never stop. It keeps coming and coming. And as long as you water it and give it its nutrients and gives it, give it whatever it belongs, which you get from a Sunday morning message, which you get from worship, when you get in your personal time with God, you get nourished and fed. The, the sap just keeps coming. But how you position yourself day after day to receive what the Holy Spirit gives and sends your way is crucial, is important in how this thing will either change your life or will make you run dry. Because sometimes you come back and you're like, what happened to the rubber? And you, you see it all falling down and somebody else has gotten it or some, another tree is produced and, and you run dry. So many Christians run dry because you don't position yourselves to receiving from God. We're so haphazard with God. We dry up when the Holy Spirit is grieved and quenched, y'all. When we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do a work inside of our lives, we allow ourselves to be dried out. Haven't you been there? Like, I've been there. Where I've been through seasons of dryness in my life. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's unintentional. But many times... When you don't position yourself to receive from God is when we sin, when we fall away from the presence of God and we're just so disoriented that we don't know where we are at any given time. And God says, man, I love you. Come back to me. I want to pour into your life. I want to do a work in your life. But we aren't just positioned. And I look at people and they go through these dry spells in their life and they don't even know it's happening to them. I call them shriveled up Christians. They think they're doing good. They come on Sunday mornings, they're there, but I see it in their faces. I see it in their prayer life. I see it in their understanding of the word. I see it in their serving. I see, because I have been there and I've seen it in my own life. Because when I'm dry, the way I preach, the way I share the gospel, the way I, I witness about Jesus is completely different from, the, from when I am filled, when I am full, when I have Jesus, when I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, when I'm ready to go. Man, it's a different kind of enigma. It's a different kind of energy. It's a different kind of power because I know that I've spent some time in the presence of God. My shell was upright, ready to receive from God. And when I'm full, I'm ready to pour out. But here's the problem with a lot of Christians. You're trying to pour out what you don't even have. You're trying to give what you don't have. So many of us are trying to serve when we haven't been served. So many of us are trying to give to people, trying to counsel people, and you're going through some issues that you need to resolve yourself. So many of you are trying to help other people's marriages, and God's like, hello, honor your wife first. Respect your husband first. That's, that's who we are. We want to we help everybody. We want to just be there for you. I, I, I love you, bro. I want to be. But what about you? Have you been fed first? You cannot, be, you cannot minister till you've been ministered to. It's so important that the Holy Spirit fills us. I don't want to see. I would hate, I would, I would hate for, for, for there to be a bunch of Christians running around in commission church that are shriveled up Christians that don't have anything to offer, but yet go knocking on everywhere. And, and what they produce is just meaningless. I don't want you to be a wrinkly and dry Christian. You know, the consequence of grieving the Spirit is that we dry up and we don't have anything to offer. Romans 8, Romans 8, let's go through this real quick. Romans 8, chapter number, five, uh, chapter number 8, verse 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to send the, set the mind in the spirit is life and peace. Here's what the, the next thing that the Holy Spirit does. Not just gives us life, but the Holy Spirit fills us with life and peace. You know the peace that passes all understanding? There are so many of us that live restless in our lives. I don't know if you've ever been there in that place in your life, but I've been through dry spells in my life where I have just not experienced peace. Absolutely. 
No matter how much I pray, no matter how much I fast, no matter how much I read the word, and I'm just being real here, I just don't feel God sometimes. And I bet there are other people here with me when I say this, that, that sometimes we just feel empty, but we can stifle the Holy Spirit when we abound, when there's the absence of peace in our lives. And, and you're like, brother, but how can I control that? What can I do? There are so many things, and that's a message for another day. But I want to remind you today, for those of us that live in peace, that are not constantly thinking about tomorrow, not worrying constantly, not saying, oh, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do that. But God says, man, cast your worries, cast your anxieties, cast your issues on me, because I care. Your burdens matter to me, is what the Holy Spirit tells us. And the moment we take that off the shoulders of the Holy Spirit, and we put that on ourselves, we stifle the Holy Spirit. We're looking at the Holy Spirit and saying, oh, that's what you do best, but I can probably do it better. And the Holy Spirit is grieving because he's like, that's why Jesus sent me. That's, that's why Jesus said, he's your comforter. He's your counselor. I'm, he's standing over there and saying, that, that's my job. That's my responsibility. But oftentimes we get caught up in this whirlwind of saying, I got this. The Holy Spirit don't know what I'm dealing with. The Holy Spirit don't know my relationship issues. He does. He does. He does. I got good news for you. He does. The problem is when we start taking on worldly abilities and worldly ways to tackle our spiritual issues, man, God puts us in situations where we're like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I can do this. But, but God says, man, I, I, my, the Holy Spirit is there to help you through this. You can stifle him when you're bound. Romans 8, 15, the Bible says this, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You know what else the Holy Spirit does? He helps you live in freedom. He gives you freedom. You stifle the Holy Spirit when you choose fear to reject the Father's love. When you turn on your prodigal switch, which happens to me very often, Ashish goes prodigal on God so many times. Every single time you look at God and say, God, I got this. I'm grown up. I'm wearing my big boy pants now. I think I, I, I've been trained, God. Thank you. I've been in the prayer house. I, thank you. I think I've, I've matured enough. I got this, Dad. Give me what belongs to me. Let me go on my merry way. That's when God looks at you and says, man, you're stripping yourself off a covering that is so valuable to you. We stifle when we get distant from God. God feels far away when you quench the Spirit of God. And, and how many of you today are pushing God away every single moment to the point where God's like, man, I feel stifled. I feel quenched. I'm hurting. The fourth way, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, is what the Bible says, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Number four, your body is the residence of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit prides himself in living inside of you? God loves the fact that he has taken up residence in your heart, but you stifle the Holy Spirit when you resell what has already been bought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again. You stifle the Holy Spirit when you resell your body that has already been bought. The Bible very clearly says that. It says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So because you were bought with a price, because there's a price tag on you, because you're valuable, because there's, there's something great and good and amazing about you that somebody was willing to dry in the cross for you because of that, glorify God in and through your body. I'm talking to young people today. I'm talking to married people today. I'm talking to unmarried people today. The Holy Spirit grieves when you don't treat your body like the temple of the living God. 
He died on the cross. This is not popular messages, so it's not something that you're going to clap your hands with, jump up and down and get excited about, but I got to be truthful and honest this morning. Your bodies are God's property. Treat it with honor. Treat it with respect. Unmarried folks sitting over here, in all your experiences with with dating people, in all your experiences with getting to know people, in all your experiences with with, with, with getting getting into close relationships with people from the opposite sex, remember this. Remember to draw a boundary around your body to where you look at God and say, I honor you in everything I do. Protect the sanctity of your body. Let the people around you know, the people that you're in relationship with know that your body is God's till God gives you your body to that other person in the covenant of marriage. It's probably not popular, cultural, a thing to say, but you know what? I can't steer away from the Bible because the Bible is is God's word and God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And for some of y'all, you're like, but pastor, I'm probably too late for that. It's never too late for the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you and never too late for you to come into the presence of God and say, sorry, God, I messed up. I let it go. I let my body go. But today I want to make a resolve. I want to make a decision. I want to give you my body. I want to make sure that I don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The, my body is the temple of the living God. And because it's a temple of the living God, it was bought by the blood of Jesus. And I have no right to sell my body at any cost to anybody under any circumstances. When, when the Holy Spirit is grieved... The Holy Spirit is quenched. And in verse number 20, he catches up and he says, do not despise prophecies. Do not despise prophecies. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. He says, test them all. Here, Paul is connecting quenching the Holy Spirit with rejecting prophecy. I said this before and I'm going to say it again. Do not despise the supernatural because you don't understand it. Being a spirit-led church, we always look at the Holy Spirit and say, we might not understand what's going to happen, but we're going to be okay if the Holy Spirit decides to move. Just because we can't understand something, it doesn't mean that it's not right. It's very biblical when the Bible talks about prophecy. Prophecy. Again, Paul has to address this because somebody in the group is causing issues and saying, oh, prophecy, that's like suit saying, that's cultural, that's like going in front of a person that can read my future and read my palms, and they were trying to confuse that prophecy with that, and, and Paul is like trying to say, guys, you don't have to believe in it, you don't have to, don't despise it though, don't go around spreading rumors, and don't go around telling people that this is wrong, or this is right, or he's this, or he's that, or she's this, or she's that, prophecy is from God, but he says, as much as you and I should not despise it, do not treat it with contempt, you should be able to test it. This is where I want to draw the line. We should not treat it with contempt, but we should, he's, he's basically saying, man, there's so many rejecting the supernatural, but I pray that just because you have never experienced the supernatural, don't reject the supernatural. You'd be amazed at the number of people that have rejected the supernatural, and when the supernatural has happened in their life, they're like, thank you, Jesus. Uh, I I now believe. That's amazing. But it takes humility. It takes humility to say, God, I may not know, or I may not understand this, but if this is the work of the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit prophesies, which I can very clearly tell you that there is prophecy, even today, There is clear prophecy that God speaks to his people through people or directly in your prayer time. There is prophecy. You don't have to understand it fully, but don't despise it. Don't say that we don't need prophecy because prophecy is speaking words of God. You don't want to quench it. You're going to have people that come up to you and say, oh, you know what, Divya, God, I was praying yesterday and God told me this and this and this and this about you. You know what despising prophecy would be? Would be to look at her and say, shh, 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 I don't want to hear anything you have to say. I don't believe in that. That would be despising. That would be, but, but, 
But at that point in time, you just have to stand your ground and you have to listen. Do you say, God, God said something to you? Tell me what God told you. I want to give you a year. I want, you to, I want to listen to this. I want to listen to what God spoke to you about me, about my situation. And I want you to explain this to me. And, and if that is from God, that person might be telling you something that nobody in this world knows about. And you've probably been in that place, and I've been in that place, where I've been at, at, at certain church meetings, and, and somebody would come up to me out of nowhere, and I, I don't even know his middle name and his last name, and I probably knew his first name, came up to me and said, Ashish, I was praying, and God said this and this and this to me, and I want you, and I'm like, there's no way in the world that anybody knew about that particular thing he said. And for me, that was a validation that that was from God. Because A, it matched up with what was going on in my life, and B, it matched up with the word of God. Or it matched up with what God already told me in the past. And there are other times, whack times, that somebody would come up to you and say, oh, shush, man, the Holy Spirit told me that 10 years ago, August 22nd, this happened to you in your life, and you've been scarred by it. I'm like, man, I, no, no, did not happen. But I, I listen, I listen, and I take it with a grain of salt, and I know that at times, uh, you know, we're all men, and sometimes people can hear wrong, and people can understand wrong, but the Bible says, do not treat it with contempt, but test it all. Testing, and we're going to that in the next one. In verse 21, he says, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. The opposite of holding fast is letting go. Sometimes you just got to listen, and if it doesn't match up with the word of God, and it doesn't match up with what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, or what has happened to you, you just got to let it go. Because that wasn't from God. Do not despise it because there is prophecy. There is the power of God that can move. But the Holy Spirit says, test it and make sure that it is right. Why? Why do we have to test it? First John chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. As people of God, remember... We live in spiritual warfare where there are many spirits that we're surrounded by. There are good and there are bad. It is up to you and me as Christians to discern what is from God and what is not from God. Am I talking to somebody? That comes through prayer. That comes through spending time in the presence of God. He says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets has gone out of the world. Jesus said that. Man, in the end times, there's going to be a lot of false prophets, a lot of people. Anyone can stand up with a deep voice and say, this is the word of the Lord. But, but God looks at us and says, man, I'm giving you the discerning to test it and to see what has already been revealed in the word. Is it confirming the word of God? Is it confirming what God has already done in my life? Is it confirming what God will do in my life? I believe in prophecy. In fact, for, for many of y'all that have gone through Grow Track, you know this is, as the truth, that this church was planted out of God looking at us through a prophetic wo voice and confronting our disobedience. When God looked at Sonia and I and said, I want you to plant the church, guess what we did? We didn't say, yes, God, here I am. We ran away from it. Sonia and I said, nope, 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 in the most harshest way possible. We looked at God and said, no, not doing it. We can't do it. We can be missionaries. We'll be evangelists. We'll do everything else in ministry, but we don't want to be pastors. And God confirmed through different prophecies and prophets and, and God's voice in looking at people that didn't even know us coming up to us on our doorstep and saying, we didn't the moment God said, plan a church, we said no, and that was it. We didn't talk to one person about it, but there was knocks on our doors. And before people would leave our door, they say, can we pray for you? And the moment they would start praying, they're like, God is telling me that you're planning a church. And we're like, oh, here we go. I'm like, there's no way you knew about this. But this has been a product of God's prophetic voice speaking to our disobedience. And sometimes God does that. When you're rebelling and when you're walking away from God, God brings people to prophetically speak into your lives to bring you back and to realign you with the purposes of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, the Bible says this, let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what he has said. It's so important that in a prophetic voice, you look to God for confirmation and say, God, if this is from you, would you validate this? Would you confirm this? 
We have that in place here. If there's anybody, we, we are open to the move of the Holy Spirit in our church. If there's somebody here that says, man, God spoke to me. I want you to be, feel free to come up here during the prayer time and share it with our prayer partners who will pray with you and who will ask God for wisdom, who will say, God, would you give us wisdom? Our elders are all around this place who can pray with you and ask God for wisdom for something that God has spoken to you about. If God has given you a word for our church, if God has given you a word for me, but if God has given you a, a word for a whole church, don't hesitate to come up to me and share it with me. I would rather you do that than standing up there and screaming on top of your lungs, which I've seen a lot. But the Bible says, let there be order in the house of God. That, that's what the Bible says over there. It says, let there be order in the house of the Lord so that there may be order. How do you weigh something? You always put something on the scale and you have a counterweight, right? The counterweight is the word of God. Are you countering everything that is being said to you by a counterweight, which is the word of God? We, we, and that's the thing. We can't test something without knowing with a counter. Like, unless and until you know the word, you won't be able to test it. Am I talking to somebody? It's like somebody asking you to verify something or validate something, and you're like, how do I do that? But if you have the knowledge of that, it's like, Jeff, if you're, you're a pharmacist. Uh, when somebody comes to fill in their prescription, right, you... you you have to make sure that there are some checks and balances. You, you have to make sure as soon as, before you fill in that prescription, you have, to, you, 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 have to, you have to do some comparisons. You have to use the knowledge that you have, right? You have to bring back all the schooling that you did and all the names of all the medications that you know, the side effects and this and this and this, and everything works in a matter of seconds to weigh the information that you just received. And you will not fill a prescription until you know for sure that what you're doing is right. Knowledge of the word gives you the ability to weigh and to be able to understand and to be able to differentiate between right and wrong. Get rooted in the word. Read the word, study the word more. We're about to close. Worship team, would you come up? The Bible says this, abstain from every form of evil. Can I make a statement here? All sin, not small, not big, all sin, dampens and quenches the Holy Spirit that longs to dwell in your heart and my heart. Every sin, big or small, has the propensity to quench the Holy Spirit. It will quench the Holy Spirit. And then he begins, he's done with the 13 commands that he gives the church. And then he begins this prayer in verse 22. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, he who called you is faithful and he will surely do it. Can I remind you of something this morning? Our God is a God of peace. If there's somebody that's going through something that is unsettling in your heart, you call on the name of Jesus. There is peace that passeth all understanding. In the most intensive moments in my life where I have not felt God, I have buried myself in a prayer closet, gone on my knees, and all I've said is, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I didn't have words. I didn't have any more words to say. I didn't have any more, you know, stuff to, 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 to talk about. There were no more conversations to be had. It was just the name of Jesus. And every single time I did that, I can tell you, the peace of the Lord, the peace that passes all understanding would completely drown me and take over me. In the middle of your chaos, he's a God that reveals himself to you. But Paul says this, may the peace of God sanctify you completely through and through. Now listen to this. Day after day, you and I are called by the Holy Spirit and prompted by the Holy Spirit to be more like Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to make you more like Jesus. And Paul's prayer is, let them become more like you. Their whole body, their whole soul, their whole spirit like you. And then he gives them a guarantee. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. 
Can I give you a word of promise today? He, God, is a promise-keeping God, Taylor. No matter what your issue, no matter what your problem, no matter what your struggle, no matter what your disbelief, no matter what your circumstance, I have good news for you. My God, if he has given you a promise, those promises are a yes and amen. And even though it travails, and even though it takes time, my God will bring every promise to pass in his time. And that's a word that will never change. And for us that have been hurt, that have been put down, that have been disappointed by people who have not kept their promises, that's a little difficult to understand. But try God's guarantee. And you know what God's guarantee is? Lo and behold, I will be with you even till the end of time. And that means everybody may forsake you and walk out on you. But you can be guaranteed that the love of Jesus will never walk away from your life. And that's what Paul is blessing them with. He's blessing them with a promise keeper. He's committed to make you everything he has called you to be and to prepare you for the coming of his son. So in verse 25, he says, brothers, pray for us. Till now, he's telling them, man, I'm praying for you. But he's come to that point where he's like, man, there's so much on my plate. There's so much on my heart. There's so much weighing me down. Pray for me. Church, remember to pray for the people that pray for you. Please remember to pause and pray for the people that pray for you. And in verse 26, he says, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. That's not a pickup line, fellas. Spurgeon is translating that to modern day language. American culture and he's saying make sure that when you meet people and see people on a Sunday morning don't give them the cold shoulder I see you're doing that go and give them a handshake go give them that hug tell them that they are loved tell them they matter to God tell them that you notice them Come on, somebody. Am I talking to somebody here? The church has to be a place of comfort and strength and, and, and a place of welcoming and acceptance. And unless people feel that in, the, in this church, they will not feel the love of Jesus. Let them feel the love of Jesus when they see your face on a Sunday morning, when they feel your embrace on a Sunday morning, when they see your irresistible pursuing of their lives on a daily basis. Let them see the eyes of Jesus. Let the church be a place of affection and embrace. We're a family. And he says, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read out to all the brothers. He says, read this. Encourage one another. On an everyday basis, I pray that you will encourage your brothers and sisters in the faith with the word of God. But here's the thing. You can't encourage somebody with something that you don't know. Read up on your word so that you'll be able to send something to somebody, encouraging them through what they're going through in their lives. And he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. It's a farewell. It's a goodbye. You know, when you say goodbye to somebody, you're saying goodbye. You're saying farewell. I hope that you will fare well. I hope that you're going to be okay. See you soon means I hope, I wish that I get to see you soon. But this farewell is not like those farewells. There is a, it's not a wishful farewell. It's not like, I hope I get to see you soon. It's a, it's a farewell of surety. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. It's more of a man, no matter what comes against us. Love, there might be death that might separate us. There might be people that might come against us. I might not see you again. But one thing I know, that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will always be with us. Would you stand up to your feet, church? As we approach communion this morning, I'm gonna ask our team to just walk around and if, and I know there's some people that have gotten it and some people that haven't gotten communion. If you haven't gotten communion, would you slip up your hands real quick so that they can bring it by to you so that you can pick it out? And, and lead, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Leave your hands up in the air till you receive yours, please. They're, they're walking around making sure you get it. As we approach communion this morning, yes, there's this solemnness that surrounds this, this amazing moment where we get to come together and partake in the Lord's Supper together. There's beauty in that. Is there anybody else that needs one? Anybody that we missed? Thank you, team. Thank you very much. This book, as much as it prepared us to turn our worlds upside down, it also prepared our hearts to look to the Savior that's coming soon. We've been praying so much for people that we care about. Lisa, we've been praying for Mary. Bithu Jasmine, we've been praying for David. There's so many of you here that are of unspoken needs and illnesses of, that you're going through in your lives that you've shared with me personally, that, that I've been praying for. Sonia and I have been agreeing and praying for personally. You know, this moment is one of the most important moments where we get to share what we get to share as a church. This, this communion does not belong to Commission Church. We don't, we don't own this. It's not something that we do exclusively. We tell people we, we have an open table here at Commission, which means you don't have to be a member of our church to partake of this because we don't, this doesn't belong to us. You don't have to sign a covenant to take this. All we ask is you have a relationship with Jesus and you know what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And in a nutshell, what he did on the cross of Calvary was everything. It was life-changing. He died on the cross. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on, the, die on the cross for your sin and my sin. We're all sinners. And through that death on the cross, Jesus died on your behalf for your sin, for your sicknesses, for your pain. And he said, because of my death, you will have to not go through death. There are so many people that don't know what's going to happen to them after they die. Can I tell you something? I know exactly what's going to happen to me after I die. And as, as, although this might sound weird and crazy and mental, I can't wait for the day that I breathe my last on this earth because that day will be the first that I'll be breathing in heaven where I get to be with this Jesus that I preach so passionately about day after day. And I can't tell you how glorious that day is going to be. See, I have that hope because, because I know what Jesus did on the cross and I've accepted that in my life and I know that that's what Jesus did for me. And my heart's desires that everybody in this room, everybody watching me online, you have that personal relationship with Jesus. Or if I ask you where you are going to go, if you breathe your last today, would you be excited about it or would you be fearful about it? Because chances are that if you're afraid of death and if you're afraid about the, die, the, the day you might die, you need to reevaluate your relationship with Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I know Sonia is going to hurt. Oh, she's not here. I was like, Sonia. I know Sonia is going to hurt. I know my family, my, my kids are not going to have their daddy around anymore. But I'm okay with that because I've used the last five years of my life to tell my five-year-old about Jesus. She knows about Jesus and I'm happy and my two-year-old knows about Jesus and I'm happy because, because they will be in good hands because you all will be there to tell them about Jesus till he comes again and, and guess what? Jesus is coming back soon. I want to encourage you with that. And, and that day will be the day that he will take us up with him. We don't have to keep doing this forever. The Bible says, do this as often as you can. The Bible talks about this bread. And he says, this bread is the body of Jesus. We do this because we remember what Jesus did on that cross. 
He gave his everything, his last breath, his last ounce of blood flowed out of his body because of my sin, Jay, because of my sin. His body was broken, the Bible says, because of his stripes, I am healed. Not I may be healed, but I am healed. And you know that thorn in the flesh that I always complain about? God, even though I don't get a physical healing on my time in the earth, I know that when you come back for me, there will be a day where there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain. It will not dictate who I am or my image. I will have a new body in Christ Jesus. I look forward to that day. But I know that because I take this today, I remind myself, of the healing stripes of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he said it was for your sickness. And when I take this cup today, it says, do this in remembrance of me. So I look back at what he did on the cross and I remind myself today that he's a God of promise, that he's a healer, that he's a savior. Would you pick up that bread this morning? Let this be a reminder this morning of God's faithfulness. And the day Jesus was betrayed, he took up the bread. The Bible says he gave thanks. He gave thanks. And he broke it. Can you break this bread with me today? He broke the bread, showing the disciples <laughs> that in a few hours, you're going to witness gory. You're going to witness terrible, horrible. Some of y'all are going to want to run away from everything I've taught you so far when you see what's about to happen. What you heard this morning was a crackle. <laughs> what happened on the cross was far from a crackle. And he said, this is my body that has been given to you. By his stripes, you are healed, church. If there's something you're praying for, is there somebody that you're praying for? This morning, we're going to believe together in prayer. All right, and we're going to pray that God sends his healing power on us as a church, on our body, and our, on our families, and our, the people that we care about. Father, we thank you for this bread. As we partake of this, I pray, God, that this will be life-fulfilling. It will be life-changing. I pray for the sick and the weak and the hurting amongst us. I pray for healing in their bodies. In Jesus' name, be free, be, be, be set free in Jesus' name. Walk in freedom, walk in liberty, because by his stripes you've been healed. We thank you, God. Thank you for your body. Thank you for what this signifies. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we partake of this bread together, church? And then he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. It's this that reminds you and me that my sins have been washed clean. The Bible reminds us, examine yourself, look deep inside before you partake of this. Because the implications of this can be life-changing. For those of you who know how to take this Remembering the work on the cross, this lifts your soul, it lifts your spirit, it, it changes who you are. Examine your hearts. If you do not know Jesus today, I pray that you will have a relationship with him. And right before we partake this, I want to give you that opportunity. There's somebody standing here and you've never given your life to Jesus. And you, you, you say, Pastor, I, I, I really want to get to know this Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, you might be watching online. You might be standing here. I cannot end this service without giving that opportunity. If that's you and you say, I've never given my life to Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus right now. All it takes is for you to pray a simple prayer. Just pray after me. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want to be your child. 
I am a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. Make me whole again. Be my king. Be my Lord. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom, kingdom of Jesus. Welcome to relationship with Jesus. And this is a symbolic representation of just that, is that relationship with Jesus. So he took that cup, he gave thanks. Father God, we thank you for this cup and the symbolic representation of this cup. We ask that you bless this cup. Help this to be of nourishment to our bodies, to our souls. And I pray that every person that made that decision to follow you today will know the depth of the symbolic representation of this cup through the suffering and the death of Jesus on the cross. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we partake of this together? I'm gonna ask the worship team to lead us in a few moments of worship and I'm gonna come back and pray and close. But as usual, we're gonna have our prayer partners up here. If there's anybody that needs prayers, please, please avail of this opportunity. Step out of your seats, come. We would love to pray for you. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.